Hello, History of Christianity students. I'm sitting in the uh, shack of knowledge somewhere in a snow-covered plain in the month of March. I have a fire behind me, and according to my dog, I have wolves out in front of me somewhere in the beyond the snowfield that I can see. So if you hear some noises in the background, it could be the fire, could be the wolves, but it'll be most likely my dog thinking she's defending me against the wolves who I'm sure are ignoring her to the best of wolfly ability. The slides that I'm recording now are the first in a series which will fall under uh, a set called Fifth Set of Slides, I believe, when, it, when you see it in PDF. So the PDF sets relating to these recordings are going to be called the Fifth Set of Slides. The fourth is a series on monasticism which could be listened to or recorded or discussed in class any time. So fourth set of slides is a little bit out of order from the type of narrative of early Christian thought, which continues the stuff we discussed in the third set of slides. That's kind of continuing here with the fifth set. The topic in this particular recording is the early issues with the Trinity or monarchianism and the response. At the heart of the earliest Christian teaching, even in the New Testament, I would say especially in the New Testament, Christ is portrayed as both divine and a mediator between God and man. The reason I use quotation marks and the reason for the slightly gendered language is that I'm quoting from the New King James Version. Uh, you can check the verses yourself. These are two verses which back one another up. Christ is both divine and a mediator between God and humanity. How can that be? How can one be both God and something that mediates between God and humans? The paradox of, both, of Jesus both being divine and something separate enough from the Father to be called a mediator is acceptable when we use the language of Stoicism and Middle Platonism in which Christ could be portrayed as the Logos, or the personified divine reason. Divine reason would both be identical with God and proceeding from God, or as the phrase went in the writings of Origen of Alexandria, the, as light proceeds from a candle, so the sun proceeds from the Father, or emanates. That's another key word which you're going to have to get comfortable with when studying early Christianity, as light emanates from a candle, or for that matter, the heat from a fire. It's an apt analogy, as I've got one uh, right next to me. Think of this in light of John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word comes to dwell among people. He makes his tenting, to translate the Greek quite literally, makes his tenting among people. So he proceeds from the Father as light is separate from the candle that gives light. That's the only way in which you talk about a separation. It's an organic, very natural procession. Now the light from a candle, Origen liked because it does not, in his mind, confine things to time. Whenever there's a candle, there's light. Whenever there is God, there is the Son. Whenever there is the Father, there is the Son. For the most part, Christians accepted this as a mystery. It's something that transcends human reason because human reason is confined to categories which God inherently transcends because God invented categories. God invented human reason. God invented a human reason which could form categories based upon what it observed in nature and in scripture. Because God transcended the normal limits of time and space, you have to accept that you aren't going to think or perceive things as they are in God. However, in the writings of Justin Martyr and a few others, it appeared as if too much had been said, and some took his, took his words perhaps a great deal more literally than he intended them to be taken. Justin's claim that Christ was a God alongside God, which he, he brings these words into play during a debate where he's trying to explain that Jesus is divine. So that's the real point. 
this appeared to go against the concept of monotheism. It looks like you have two gods if you just take that statement out of context and in and of itself. Uh, monotheism says there is only one God, and Christians are monotheists. The scriptures say there is only one God. So how can Justin use this type of language? He must have gone too far. To be balanced, the majority of folks didn't uh, get this out of Justin in the second century or third century as it as they read Justin's writings. Justin's defenders pointed out that he was working within the limits of earthly categories and language to defend a mystery. And this really wasn't the point he was making. You know, if you would have pinned Justin down, in other words, Justin's Justin's followers and his avid readers are saying, you know, that's not what he meant. You're getting carried away with a use of language. He was limited by earthly language to having to describe something which is beyond all description. So he did the best he could. And this is very typical. Uh, both Jewish and Christian scholars have always said this about the scriptures themselves. They have to be able to be understood by common people. Therefore, God accommodates common people by using earthly language and making references which which can be understood as far as God needs to be understood, but which are all which always fall short of the transcendent truth of a God who created both space and time, a truly transcendent God. Um, just part of the standard furniture is that these God exists in mystery and human language is not capable of describing that mystery. However, there were some who tried, and this begins a series of heresies which will lead us up through the heresies of the 4th century, the Arian heresy and its analogs, and the first version of this family of heresies, if you will, is called monarchianism, its most primitive form, and this we see already in the 2nd century, the same century as Justin Martyr, if a little later. Beginning at the turn of the 3rd century, that means end of the, of the 100s and turn of the 200s, several groups were bothered by the paradox of monotheism and the clear distinction of Christ from the Father, which is found in the New Testament. These groups that are bothered this way were never a majority, but they were all very vocal minorities who tried to solve the problem in different ways. And these groups you will certainly have to be acquainted with. All of them are what were called, at the time and now, monarchianists, or the Greek and Latin equivalents of that name. They were concerned with preserving the power and authority of the one supreme God. You have to be, first of all, monotheist, and that means the one supreme God remains one, singular, and supreme. They did this in several different ways. The first clear monarchian movement was called adoptionism. This is associated with Theodotus, who was a tanner from Byzantium, a fairly simple fellow, but a sincere believer and one who wanted, wanted to be able to have a logically clear and, and non-contradictory faith and reading of the scriptures. His movement gained ground around 190, he argued that Jesus was a mere man on whom the power of God descended at the baptism. Therefore, when the voice of the Father uh, speaks, This is my Son, today I have begotten him, and the Spirit descends like a dove, this is actually Jesus being adopted, the man Jesus adopted into union with the Godhead without being truly God. This movement was very popular, especially in Latin-speaking Rome. The tendency was to emphasize those parts of Scripture where Jesus claims to be one with the Father and to explain them as having been adopted into that oneness. So Jesus spent most of his early life as a human being, like any other human being, if, if a bit more um, pious and, and clearly set aside for a special purpose, and then at his baptism, He's adopted by the Godhead so that he can, as a human, join in some type of union with God. What they do with the Spirit remains a mystery to me. I think there are several answers that, that quickly develop among the adoptionists that are, are, do not agree with one another, but it's a way of handling the Spirit. That the Spirit is some form of angel, 
that the Spirit is simply the kind of a spiritual substance sent down by God to dwell on the man Jesus so that he can become one with God. This seems to be what Theodotus the Tanner was, was arguing early on. By the way, Byzantium at this point in history was a well-fortified fishing village and not the massive city it would become later on. Theodotus would have spoken Greek, but the reason this caught on in the Latin West is that Latin always struggled with categories and wanted the language itself demands a certain logical consistency even in its speaking, which you don't have in Greek. And so the, it's, it seems natural to me, as I look back over church history, that in Latin-speaking Rome, this movement would be particularly popular. It fits with the bent of the Latin mind. So that's answer number one. There's a lot of questions we have about the movement. We don't have any you know, clear writings, and it appears from the writings against adoptionism that are out there that there were several forms that did different things with the spirit. But the basic narrative, God sends down a kind of spiritual creature or substance to dwell on and be and unite the man Jesus with, with divinity in some way. This is the basis of adoptionism. Answer number two, which came just a bit later, the answer of the Noetians, followers of Noetus, or the Patrapassians. The Patrapassianism is the movement. Noetians are the followers of Noetius who developed it. The, this answer says that Jesus was divine. In fact, he was exactly the one true God. There is no difference between Jesus and the Father. There's no two persons in the Godhead, much less three. So the Father, the one God, comes from heaven to suffer and die. Therefore, from the name Father suffered, or from the, the phrase that the Father suffered, comes the name Patre, Father, Passion, the Father suffers. So the Father suffered on the cross because there is only one God, and that one God is the one who suffered on the cross. This raises a host of problems in reading the Gospels, particularly in the Gospel of John, where Jesus is talking to the Father as his Father and as, some, and as if the Father is something distinct from himself, the Son. It also raises issues with the other Gospels, where Jesus is called the Son of God, uh, it seems like there is some type of separation between father and son in this language that you have to account for, and the Patropassians cannot. There, there's no way to really handle these scriptures other than to say that Jesus was just putting on a show. You know, I'm going to talk to myself for a while because you human beings would only understand me if I referred to God as somebody separate from me. Uh, you know, it gets, it gets pretty crazy pretty fast. And the Noetians, while a significant loud voice in their time, uh, never spread very far because they clearly have issues with uh, what the scriptures actually say. Answer number three remains popular today even among people who think that they are not heretics. In fact, I hear it an awful lot from clergy of every stripe, including a few Orthodox priests who usually get pulled aside by me after service and uh, have a little talking with them. And I say, you know, are you, are you keen on, on preaching heresy? Because if you are, I, there may be issues when you stand before the dread judgment seat of Christ and explain how you as a clergyman preached heresy. They usually look shocked and a little bit hurt and say, well, what do you mean? And then I point out what they'd just been saying was condemned as Sibelianism by every generation of the church since the third century. And it is precisely this. It's also called modalism. It, uh, the, the fellow who uh, championed the movement again, though I don't think he was the first to come up with it, a chap by the name of Sibelius, hence Sibelianism, or modalism. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just three different modes or masks of God. Three different ways in which the one true God appears and deals with human beings as, for instance, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. And this is what you're going to have a lot of pastors of every stripe saying, because some, sometime in the 19th century, um, a, uh, this, the heresy came back in force. And as a way of handling 
the, the problems of explaining the Trinity, Creator, the Father, Redeemer, the Son, and Sanctifier, the Spirit, started being discussed as if they were separate modes or si simply separate operations of, of the one triune God. The creed seems to divide this way, but in fact it doesn't. None of the people writing the great creed, which we will, account, which we will encounter a couple lectures from now, none of the people writing the creed of Nicaea thought that you should truly, strictly divide the work of the Father from the work of the Son from the work of the Spirit in such a way that God has three actions, and those actions uh, somehow account for the Trinity. The scriptures, furthermore, don't read this way. Certainly, God the Father, or the name Father, is often referred to in such a way that he's the ultimate source of all creation, but the Father is also the source, in a very different way, of the Son and the Spirit, that proceed, the Spirit proceeds from the Father, and the Son is begotten of the Father. So the Father is always source. If you read the scriptures carefully, with these, this language of Trinity in mind, the New Testament especially refers to Jesus, the Son, the Logos, and the Spirit also engaging in the act of creation. It refers to Father and Spirit also engaging in the act of redeeming. It's not just the Son. And it refers to Father, Son, and Spirit being the ones that sanctify or, or bring the church to its perfect state of being. So... It, it seems to people when I pointed out that this is being picky, but in fact it leads toward a simplistic view of a God who must, by the earliest definitions and by the scriptural readings of the first century, transcend all definition if that God is truly God. Long way of saying, keep your eyes out for it, and this might be something to bring up in the discussion section. As with all lectures, I hope you're taking notes on a separate sheet of paper. I don't know how it wouldn't be a separate sheet of paper. You can t hardly take notes on the sheet of paper in front of me because it's a computer screen. But you're ho taking notes on a sheet of paper and we can discuss this further when we see one another in class. All of these answers to how God can be monotheus or mo uh, monos, monos, singular, and how there can be a distinction between Father and Son. Answer one, Jesus is just a man. Answer two, the distinction really doesn't exist. Or answer three, uh, the distinction only exists according to the actions of the three. Uh, all of these were condemned by the mainstream as heresies for denying parts of the apostolic message in the scriptures. They don't fit with the text. Or more specifically, they're condemned for over-rationalizing a transcendent mystery. Again, all of, these, all of these early heresies regarding the Trinity don't really bother the East to the degree they bother thinkers in the West, with the possible exception of uh, uh, Sabellianism. The key is the flexibility of the Greek mind. Latin mind just isn't as flexible as the Greek. The Greek mind isn't bothered by one thing being three things and three things being one thing, so long as you describe it correctly. A little bit of set theory goes a long way if you're into algebra. This leads to the most important question asked by historians, so what? Um, a great many people don't care about these debates. They, they think it might be a little bit too nitpicky or... or uh, to concerned with philosophical questions, when what really matters today to modern Christians is, do you believe in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Well, you know what? Nowhere in the first, oh, seven or eight hundred years of the church, um, and I'm just throwing that out there because those are the centuries I know best, other than the Reformation, nowhere would anyone have asked a question like, is Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? That's, that's, a, that's a question of the 18th and 19th centuries they would have thought, you're a little nuts, you modern Christians, for asking such a silly question that obviously goes against the scriptures. Jesus is not a personal Lord and Savior. He is a personal God who saves all who are attached to him through union with the one true church. So keep in mind that if these debates seem 
seem a bit foreign, these were the hot item. These were the very heart and soul of what it meant to be a Christian. After all, they came about not from children who simply do what children naturally do with mysteries. A child can be a Christian because a child receives with her heart, with her eyes, with her perception, what is revealed to be true. It's only when the understanding grows to a point that it thinks it knows and thinks it can explain things beyond its own reasoning that human pride has become a stumbling block. And it's because these arguments, these heresies, are stumbling blocks that the imagination, the human reason, sets up for the faith that they have to be answered. The debates of the second and third centuries do reveal the inherent philosophical tension in being both monotheist and claiming that Jesus is somehow divine. The variety of explanations erupted into a great many more debates, and this is why you have to pay attention to the early forms. Monarchianism has children and grandchildren. And we'll see this when we get into the 4th century and start discussing Arianism in its various forms, uh, some of the uh, problems that arise with the solutions to Arianism create greater problems, such as with Nestorius, and this will lead to the great ecumenical councils and the creed, uh, or the great creed, as we'd call it, the creed, the creed of Nicaea, which is the one universal now baptismal formula. A central rule in all was to maintain the fact that the way God actually is is a transcendent mystery. In other words, children get it better by simply accepting it. The human, the adult human mind that tries to reason it out is behaving childishly. It's beyond reason. This will always appear as a paradox. Martin Luther was quite fond of talking about the paradoxes of God, which is the only way to understand what God by nature is. Another central rule for the Christians involved in responding to these heresies was that the scriptures had revealed the nature of the Trinity as far as it could or should be understood. You don't go beyond what the scriptures have said. To do so is to add all kinds of things that will by, simply by adding them, contradict the apostolic message. The scriptures are perfectly reasonable. People like Clement and Ale of Alexandria and Origen of Alexandria argue. The scriptures are perfectly reasonable if you let them reason only uh, according to their own language. When you start adding and explaining yourself, you're going to screw up. The problem is the follow following. How do you interpret what the scriptures say? And this is where, if the Patropassians have gone a bit far in uh, clearly, clearly making incomprehensible certain passages from the book of John, others are simply trying to reason it out. You have to give the adoptionists and the Sibelians credit. They think they're being true to the scriptures in all their forms. When have you gone too far in explaining a mystery? After all, some explanation is possible. Some analogy is possible in describing God. The light from a candle thing is an analogy which doesn't contradict what the scriptures actually say. Well, if that's true, why, why is talking about God's masks not acceptable? So that this is where these debates get quite sticky. They still are today, by the way. The reason Christians can't reunite and won't reunite as a single body uh, pen, barring some, you know, major action that fuses them back together. I don't see such, such a thing happening ever. Uh, just not realistic. The reason Christians remain separate is they cannot agree on how to interpret the scriptures. Right. That was going on at the turn of the third century. The textbooks claim, and this is my first uh, serious attack on the textbook, in a while at least, because the first sections have their issues, but we can read through them. Here the textbook gets quite off on the question of the Trinity and the early issues with the Trinity. The textbooks claim that Tertullian and his disciple Novation came closest to explaining how the paradox could be reconciled, places too much focus on the Western concerns of reconciling a mystery with logic. 
Keep in mind, I'm not Western. The minority group in Tertullian's world spoke Latin. The majority group spoke Greek. The textbook writers have a bias toward the West, which is very strong, toward Latin thinking. In fact, read with Eastern eyes, when we see Tertullian's writing and Novation's writing, and we would agree with the textbook that they are trying to explain the paradox and reconcile it. That itself is heresy to the East. They have believed that their rational categories and their logic have somehow explained the Trinity beyond what the scriptures themselves have given to explain. The East generally didn't suffer from the desire to have easy answers. For us, and as you know, I speak with the, the partisan bias of being an Eastern Christian, Origen and his teacher Clement of Alexandria were the ones who staked out the boundaries of a mystery, which is only mystery because the human mind is bounded by space and time while God is not. So the textbook has a serious bias toward Tertullian and Novation. Uh, this is more than just saying that, that the textbook has a Western bias. I have to say that the textbook has a bias toward rationalism, which you don't find in the early Lutheran movement, which you don't find in uh, medieval Catholicism. When, when things got too rationalistic, the Catholic Church would come out and condemn it for going beyond the clear revelation of the scriptures. This, this happened repeatedly. But in the modern world, rational answers, including rational explanations of the Trinity have become popular, and Tertullian and Novation, regarded by heretics in the early, uh, regarded by the early church as heretics, not just for their uh, marginal, and in Tertullian's case, full-blown Montanism, but also because of their willingness to rationalize mysteries, Tertullian and Novation have become more popular than they ever were in the early church. The big and most influential reasoners Certainly in the East, but they also their influence extended to the West, and you have to give them credit for, for what they did, were Origen and Clement of Alexandria. These are the ones to watch in understanding the upcoming debates. Again, the principle. God is mysterious to the human mind because the human mind is bounded by time and space, while God is not. So we have to make some adjustments to what you read in chapter 9, or should have read, or will be reading because you now feel guilty that you didn't read, in chapter 9 of the textbook. This is one of the more disappointing chapters in the entire textbook, at least of the period we're covering. In the Reformation, I'm disappointed all over the place, too. Uh, it messes up Lutheran theology in a big way. But some qualifications. Chapter 9 needs to be taken with a huge grain of salt, because certain things it says are just bizarre. Here's one of the most bizarre. It is a pure guess, and that's me, me being very generous to give them the benefit of the doubt by saying that they were guessing and not just screwing up. It is a pure guess on the part of the textbook writers that Alexandrian Christianity was somehow simple prior to Clement of Alexandria. The quotation marks are appropriate because I have no idea what they mean by simple. They just throw that in there. Uh, it's about as simple as a class in modern German philosophy. And if, and, if you, and if you hang with Immanuel Kant and think Nietzsche was kind of a, a half-witted, shallow individual, Hegel, you know, he was the the Barney the Dinosaur of German philosophers. Okay, if that's the way you think, I guess you could call Alexandrian Christianity simple. If you find quantum mechanics to be just for grade school kids, you know, who doesn't understand quantum mechanics? Come on. Then I guess you can call Alexandrian Christianity simple. Clement himself suggests that the unity between Philo Greek philosophical language and Christianity was something he inherited if he also developed the use of this language. In other words, Clement saw himself as a member of a very sophisticated philosophical tradition. And according to Clement, Christianity was more philosophical in Alexandria than anywhere else. This was the place where 
where Greek philosophy and Christianity had their, their, their greatest confluence. We have already observed that this is true all the way back. If Clement is right that Alexandria had a particular love of both Greek philosophy uh, and Christianity, we see that in the earliest books of the New Testament, and strangely, chapter 16 of the textbook contradicts chapter 9 here, this, this is part of the inherent, natural, original furniture of Christianity. It used Greek philosophical language, Greek philosophical ideas, and Greek philosophical categories to articulate, not explain, but to articulate the things of the faith. And Clement thought this was a very good thing. When the textbook writers assume that there is some type of a radical distinction between Greek philosophy and Christianity, this reveals more about the textbook writers than about historical Christianity, certainly about Alexandria. You cannot separate in the minds of an Alexandrian Christian community Greek ph philosophical categories, Greek philosophical ways of explaining things, and the Christian texts, particularly in the Greek. Um, they, were, they were big fans of what Paul did in using Stoic and Middle Platonic terms and ideas. Another thing that's just weird in chapter 9 is the use of, of the word sola scriptura on page 90. These words make no sense in the German Lutheran Reformation, where they're often regarded as being the kind of the, the central doctrine of the Reformation. They weren't then, and they have no meaning in the early church. As we've discussed in previous sense of slides, you can't say sola scriptura when determining which books are scriptura, which books are the scriptures. By the way, the words mean, uh, just to be clear, the words mean Bible alone or scriptures alone as source of truth. They weren't. They were the supreme source of truth. They were the ranked highest, and this is, this is I'm giving... Protestantism, everything I can give right here. This is how Luther saw them. This is true in the early church. But they were never alone. They stood alongside the baptismal formulas. They stood alongside the inherited teachings in the local communities. If for no other reason than without the testimony of the local communities, if you want to call it tradition, you'd be in good company with the uh, Lutherans of the Reformation, the tradition of the local communities is the only thing that determined what the scriptures were. So using the very term sola scriptura as if they have any truck in ancient Alexandria shows not just the biases of Protestant authors, but the biases of the type of Protestant who doesn't even square with the Protestantism of the Reformation. This is modern. This is a 20th century anachronism. I can't say it any more bluntly than that. Oh, yes, I can. That whole Scola Scriptura thing never happened in the early church. Nope, uh-uh, no way. Not early Christianity. By the way, never happened in the Reformation. So, you want to put it bluntly? Sola Scriptura, never happened. There we go. That's, I guess, as blunt as I can say it. Thank you, Larry the Cable Guy, for encouraging me to touch the ne ne Nebraska muse for inspiration. Origen was obsessed with getting the message of the apostolic scriptures right. He is the last thing that you would call a sola scriptura type person, though. I don't know how they come up with that. He was very concerned with interpreting the scriptures correctly. As, you, as we've seen, he's far from alone. That's kind of the whole point of all the debates that are involved. Everybody wants to, with the possible exception of the Patropassians, I don't know how they pulled that one off, everybody else seems very keen in these debates to have a proper interpretation of the scriptures. And there's no way that you could say that Origen confined himself to the literal meaning of the text. Nope, nuh-uh, never happened. Or, nope, nuh-uh, never happened. No literal meaning of the text for Origen. Sorry, didn't happen. In fact, and I want to be clear on this because a lot of you people throw around the word literal. Do you take the literal meaning of the Bible? That's a, that's a trick word in Christian history. If for no other reason 
then there is no Greek word that means what we mean when we use the word literal. Even Martin Luther, who demanded, using the Latin, the literal meaning of the text, talked about the literal meaning in ways that it was frequently figurative. So you folks that say, I want a literal translation of the Bible, A, I bet you don't because it would make no sense, because the only thing you can get is the remata according to the words of the text, which is bizarre, and B, you're asking something that nobody in the ancient church ever thought existed, because they don't think like you. Is it literal? Well, sometimes it's plain, and sometimes it's not so plain. Sometimes it's very figurative, and sometimes the most natural meaning of the words, now we're getting into good biblical interpretation language, the most natural meaning of the words is pretty figurative. Sometimes it means more than one thing. Tough stuff. Tough stuff. The people who believe in literal translations do not understand the very nature of translations. Off of soapbox, on with the slide. In any case, Origen is not, uh, is not a sola scriptura or a literal type person. The textbook also describes subordinationism in Origen. You're not going to have this. Th this is rare in the scholarly world. You just, yeah, the idea that somehow Origen subordinated the son to the father floats around out there, but it sure doesn't mesh with what we have of the writings of Origen, which is pretty extensive. The only way you can see that is, when, is in misreading him. The heresies. Now, the textbook suggests that subordinationism might have been one of the things that's condemned in Origen. Now, Origen is condemned. He's not considered a saint in Eastern or Western churches because he came up with some ideas which East and West regard as incompatible with Christianity. But those are very specific. He believed in an eternal, physical world. Well, the scriptures say God created the world. So it can't be, the, the physical world cannot be eternal outside of time. And he believed in the pre-existence of the soul, which some of you modern Christians do too. Technically, it's not a Christian idea at all. Uh, not compatible with Christianity. The idea that the soul exists off there someplace in, let's call it heaven, and then goes zat into a, an, an earthly body when a child is about to be born. Uh, this, is, this is very much the case in sacred texts such as Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You'll Go, where you have the pre-born child looking ahead at a life that the child is going to lead. Well, that idea of pre-born existence or pre-conception existence doesn't exist in Judaism or Christianity. Origen believed in it. It's an idea foreign to Christianity. Origen, it's, it's going way too far, actually, to say that he believed in it. He threw around the ideas, and in throwing around the ideas, he was willing to engage them as possibilities, speculative possibilities. It is going way too far, and I misspoke, to say that Origen believed in either of these things with any, anything like the conviction with which he accepted the central truths of Christianity. But the fact that he did have them in his writings was sufficient, and he was influential in getting other people to think this way, who did believe in it, was sufficient to get him condemned later as a heretic. Does that mean he's not in heaven? No, it just means he was wrong, and you shouldn't follow his teachings in these areas. That's all it means. There's another questionable thing about Origen, which usually causes the modern 20th, 21st century male a great deal more consternation, and that is the fact that in order to keep himself focused on things that matter, his philosophy and his faith, he paid for an operation which was essentially having himself castrated. That caused his critics to have a little different response than to accuse him of heresy. It was more like accusing him of, Ooh, man! Don't! Oh, God! What'd you do that for? That's more of the response that his critics had there. Um, nevertheless, I had, a, I had a seminary professor who uh, had, a, had a puppy, and he thought it would be be fun to uh, name his, his puppy Clement. He was a big New Testament Greek scholar. and At some point, though, after the 
the puppy's puppy got fixed, neutered, he changed the puppy's name to Origin. And his kids never understood that. Why'd you change the name of our doggy? And oh, it was, it was strange, but he, you know, historians can be really, really twisted people. Next slide, please. Let's talk a bit about what Clement and Origen did. And I'm just going to summarize here because I think this is the way to think of their influence in Christian history. And their influence is huge, far more extensive than the textbook makes it sound. Some of this is the result of a lot of recent work on Clement and particularly Origen. Between the two of them, they developed a pattern of speaking, a pattern of language, in which paradoxes could be expressed without favoring one feature over another. So you could talk about the scriptural uh, message of Jesus' divinity and his unity with the Father without favoring one idea over the next. There's no subordination. It's precisely non-subordinationist. And this pattern of language is very carefully true to the scriptures. Therefore, Christians after Clement and Origen will talk about father and son particularly using the same manner of speech, using the same words and phrases. They also, once again, clarified the compatibility of Christian revelation with Greek philosophy, especially when Clement allowed that Greek philosophers were given their insights as preparation for Christianity. I want to be very clear on this. When I say that even the Alexandrians, who uh, are the most keen on Greek philosophy of all the, all the different Christian communities in the ancient world, even the Alexandrians only saw Greek philosophy as a tool, as a way of explaining the central truth of Christianity. They did not see fusing, a fusion of Greek philosophy and Christianity. They saw the language of Greek philosophy helping to clarify, helping to explain, as far as anything can be explained, the central truths of the Christian faith. In other words, there's a clear hierarchy here. Christianity is true, and Greek philosophy is a gift of God to help understand what can be understood about Christianity, including, and this is Clement, including the limits of understanding. It's only by really recognizing the power of philosophical explanation that you recognize that human understanding has limits. Therefore, Greek philosophy helps explain that some things are beyond human reason because they transcend the, the very creation in which human reason operates. Neat stuff. Do ask questions about that because it's important to know. Often the Alexandrians are accused of blending Christianity and Greek philosophy. That would shock them. That would, that would really offend Clement and Origen particularly. They did not blend. They used Greek language and used it as a way of explaining the truths of the scriptures. They thought of themselves, as had Jews before them, such as Philo of Alexandria, as simply being the truest they could to the true revelation of the scriptures, and following a pattern laid down by Paul. Especially Origen contributed a discussion of God as transcendent of space and time, in such a way that the time-bound arguments of the Monarchians, did Jesus come before or after the Father? Was he there with the Father beforehand? The word before can't be applied to God, because God, outside of creation, existed as Father, Son, and Spirit. The Monarchians are simply screwing up by binding their language to the words associated with time before, after, when. Well, God never had to adopt the Logos because there was no when in God. There was no when the, when the Father was alone and the Son wasn't with the Father. Since they are one God that transcends time, this time-bound language is part of the problem. And Origen is particularly 
uh, responsible for that explanation. Also, Origen especially provided a pattern of language for discussing Christ as second to the Father in that he proceeded from the ultimate source, but equal to and united with the Father according to will and divinity. That's the language that shallow readers call subordinationism, and yet it's the universal language of the Church East and West. Christ proceeded from the ultimate source. Christ is not ultimate source. The Logos is not ultimate source. Even as you can't say that the Word is the lips that spoke it, something speaks the Word so that something is the source. Even as the breath that comes out of the mouth is not the ultimate source, so the Spirit is not source, but it proceeds from the source. And this is the same as the candle and light analogy. The handy thing there is if the candle is eternally burning, then the light is always eternally proceeding from the candle. Since this procession occurred outside of time, there is no before and after hierarchy between the Father and the Son, only one of procession. Light proceeds from the candle. And this becomes true then of the Spirit as well, but the big question that Origen is working with is really Father and Son. The Spirit enters into there also, and, and the whole thing fits this pattern of language. Hold on to these ideas, because you're going to see them all over the 4th century debates. In the same way then, with a little less ink spilled over the issue, the Holy Spirit can be discussed as proceeding, but the Spirit merely proceeds from the Father, whereas there is a separate relationship between Father and Son in which the Logos can be said to be begotten. A Son has a different relationship to the Father from the Spirit. The Logos has a, begot a begottenness, a sonness in relation to Father. And all Origen is doing is pointing out that we speak about the persons of the Trinity differently, and we must speak about them consistently. It's not really a blending with Greek philosophy in the Trinitarian question at all. And Origen did also develop a formal manner of reading the scriptures in which these principles are central throughout the Old and New Testaments. He both derived the language from the scriptures and then said, let's look back and see how this will help us understand the Old and New Testaments. And all is interpreted according to the incarnation of Christ. The whole point of the revelation of the Father, of Son, and of Spirit throughout Old and New Testaments as he as a Christian read them, the whole point is to reveal that God became human, the incarnation of the Logos, so that humans could be saved. These, in the second, third, fourth, fifth, and throughout the Eastern Church today, are the central truths of Christianity. The West, especially Protestants, tend to overemphasize this whole Jesus being beaten bloody and then dying on a cross. Sure, that happened. It's an important to recognize it, that that happened. But when talking about God, the central issue in God's nature, the central issue in God's identity, is not getting beaten bloody and dying on a cross. The central issue in God's identity is that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created the cosmos and wanted to be united with it. And so, in time, one person of the Trinity, the Logos, unifies the cosmos with God through his life, death, and most importantly, resurrection. Well, that's about all I've got for this section. We're going to switch briefly to discussing the persecutions again. I say briefly because I'm always summarizing, I'm always cutting myself short. And then we'll come back to discuss more of the fourth century and how these ideas played out in the period of time which most Christians, which is most formative for most Christians whether they know it or not, and which is understood by modern Christians the least. The fourth century. Big stuff going on there. So hold on. I'll be right back with you with another lecture shortly.